Welcome to CommercialDrones.fm, the podcast that explores the commercial drone industry, the people who power it, and the concepts that drive it. I'm your host, Ian Smith. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Commercial Drones FM. Today, I am sitting in Las Vegas, Nevada at the Commercial UAV Expo, and I'm with Mark Bathrick, who is the director of the Office of Aviation Services at the Department of the Interior of the United States. So welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ian. I'm uh, really glad to be here. Excellent. Cool. Well, um, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, uh, the first question is, I guess maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background, and we'll get into the Department of the Interior later, but yeah, how, how did you get into drones? Um, <clears throat> I'm going to show my age here, but uh, <laughs> I've been in uh, drones for uh, a little over 25 years. Um, I started out as a Navy fighter pilot, and uh, Navy test pilot is where I got involved in drones, and I was involved in uh, concept development and uh, testing acquisition and actually the management of uh, some operational uh, test drones that we had, um, uh, QF-4 Phantoms, which were the largest uh, drones in the Navy's fleet at the time. We used them for uh, targets as well as uh, for some scientific study we did. Hmm. And when you say targets, what do you mean? Like for target practice, basically? Well, we use those uh, those drone aircraft in the unmanned configuration, of course, to uh, test out missiles against the full-scale target. So we use them as that. We also use them in an unmanned configuration to test out uh, equipment that um, was a little bit hazardous, and we didn't want to uh, subject the pilot to that risk. So we'd fly it in the unmanned configuration. Gotcha. Okay. So heavy aviation background. Heavy aviation background. Nice. Yes. And what kind of aircraft were you piloting whenever in your uh, combat experience? Uh, my my uh, primary plane was the F-14 Tomcat. Okay. And nice. uh, went to Top Gun and test pilot school and had a squadron on the carrier Enterprise and then a test squadron out in California. And and finally, uh, my last uh, command before I retired was uh, base commander at one of the uh, air engineering stations uh, the Navy had. So were you, were you taking off and landing from aircraft carriers? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Day and oh, night. Oh, man. That is crazy. <laughs> I can't imagine a, a night landing on an aircraft carrier. It's a, a pretty stressful experience, <laughs> I tell you. Oh, man. Yeah, we used to, I mean, yeah, my piloting experience doesn't even hold a candle <laughs> to that. But um, there was times in the tiny helicopter that I felt uh, pretty stressed out. So I can only imagine that. Uh, so th well, that's really cool. So uh, extremely uh, qualified for aviation here, and it's interesting that you're here at this UAV Expo because some um, people in the drone industry who are usually, you know, well, they don't have aviation backgrounds. One time, some people were some person uh, was saying that drones really don't have anything to do with aviation, and mm. I, I, I definitely disagree. Uh, uh, heavily with that. But anyhow, um, very, very uh, aviation oriented, obviously, uh, because you're here. So you did a keynote, Mark, at the expo. Um, I think it was this morning. It, that's correct, Ian. And so what was it about? So interesting, your, your conversation, your, your uh, observation about uh, are drones really about aviation or not? I would actually agree with uh, whoever mentioned that to you and say that primarily they're not about aviation. It's really an airborne IT node. Uh, it's a way to get that sensor uh, up into the air and to get in that third dimension. However, as I mentioned in my keynote today, you can't get away from the fact that um, it's subject to the same uh, physics, aerodynamics, and human performance issues that manned aircraft have struggled with for you know 113 years now, ever since Orville and Wilbur went flying. Mm. So my uh, talk this morning was the four key competencies that you need to master uh, as a drone company to be successful. And, and they were aviation, of course, uh, privacy, uh, security, and finally culture that ties them all together. Hmm. Maybe you can tell us a little about those four things, actually. That'd be kind of interesting. I, I actually wasn't able to make the keynote this morning, so I'd love to hear, and I'm sure uh, all the <laughs> listeners out there would love to hear, too. Sure. So uh, based on my background in, uh, in aviation and in drones and uh, in my current job uh, with aviation and, and drones with the U.S. Department of the Interior, I've done a lot of thinking about, you know, what makes a company successful in this space. And, and I've gone to a lot of these expos and shows, and, and everyone tends to talk about the capabilities, the applications, and maybe about what their company is doing. What I found was nobody was talking about how to be successful. And these four competencies, they're not new competencies, but I think I have not seen them talked about uh, in this combination 
for this industry. So just briefly, the aviation component, you know, a lot of these companies are tech companies mm-hmm. and have, they don't have a lot of experience in aviation. And, and so, um, as I say, they haven't been to as many funerals as I've been to and mm. uh, as many crash sites. So, you know, it's important that they understand that um, these things are um, going to be in the air and uh, they need to be operated responsibly. And, you know, we, we share the airspace with other aircraft and we have responsibility to the people that live beneath that airspace. And we're going to be operating in the low altitude structure with the small drones, 400 feet. So our ability to uh, do something to prevent an accident when something happens is is diminished because of the lower altitude. Mm-hmm. I mentioned in my uh, piece today, there's currently over 585,000 drones registered in the United States, which exceeds the number of manned aircraft by 90%. Okay, so there's going to be a lot of them out there too. Yeah. So, so aviation needs to be you know, an element that you have mastery of. You need mm-hmm. to be very competent there. The next item is, is privacy. Privacy is one of those issues that, that in our society and in, certainly in our government seems to have no parent, but has a lot of very interested relatives who'd like to make, you know, <laughs> privacy policies and tell you what to do. And, um, you know, I tell people, if you, if you want to understand what people feel like and why they're concerned about drones, think about driving down the highway. You have cars passing you, you're passing cars. You don't think anything of it. But as soon as a black and white pulls up behind you or passes you, if you're like me, you're checking your speed. You're mm-hmm. trying to remember if you got your car re-registered and inspected. And so that's the kind of uh, feeling, I believe, that the American people have when they see a drone. Because mm-hmm. when they see your helicopter flying through the air, they pretty much know that it's taking someone or something from point A to B. Mm-hmm. And they see that drone in the air, they know there's no package on board yet. Mm-hmm. And so they're thinking it must be looking at them. So I think that privacy piece is really important. And because there is no clear owner of this issue, we see the states getting involved, we see local governments getting involved. Um, and we try to, in my program, try to be very, very proactive and sensitive to that. And the third piece is security. There's data security, there's control security. You know, when you're flying in your helicopter, you didn't have to worry about electromagnetic interference or the fact that you may have lost comms because you knew what to do in, in that case. You know, today with two-way communication between small drones and operators, you can lose control. You can lose control because of uh, distance, because of electromagnetic interference. You could also be hacked. Mm. Same thing with your payload. And so that security um, is an issue, not to mention the security, the physical security of those the small drones. Uh, I'm sure you never worried about your helicopter going home with somebody. And, you know, <laughs> but you, know, you have small drones in your company. Maybe one of your employees takes it home to film Johnny's birthday party or take it fishing with him or something. So, yeah. And then it's a liability for your company. So that's the uh, third one. And then finally, it's the culture. It's, it's bringing it all together. And, and I use an example of, let's just say you're a very large online retail company. Right now, your customer experience really happens online, and when that package I ordered gets delivered. Mm-hmm. Now you're going to enter the drone space, not FedEx, not UPS or U.S. Postal Service, but you are now responsible for everything that happens between your fulfillment center and my front door. So if I load that package wrong and the center of gravity is off and it crashes, if that drone's not ready to fly or the battery's not up to speed, so making sure that your corporate culture has shifted from where you are traditionally to now this new space, I mm-hmm. think is important. So those are the, the four points that I made. Very nice. Those are very valid points. Um, and I, I've, yeah, so far the insight has been uh, intense. This is nice. I'm learning a lot already. Uh, and I love the, the how you broke a few of those things down. I can definitely relate to that. One thing we didn't touch on is you just told me basically the rundown. So the Department of the Interior, some people can refer to it as the DOI, but basically you told me that uh, an interesting fact is that you guys are one of the lar- or the you are the largest landowner in the entire. Um, well, you'll tell me a little bit more, but you're a federal agency, and so what is the Department of the Interior? I think we need to set the stage. Sure, sure. The Department of the Interior, um, back when it was formed. In- 
1843, I think is the right date, uh, was uh, kind of uh, joked about as the department of everything else. They took a, a number of, uh, of departments and bureaus that existed and kind of put them together. Uh, as I, as you mentioned, um, we're the largest single landowner in the United States. We are responsible for the management of about 500 million acres of American land, not to mention 1.7 billion acres in the Outer Continental Shelf. And uh, and that's your land. It's all public land. Um, mm. Bureaus that you're probably more familiar with within the Department of Interior, the National Park Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, USGS, um, there are nine total uh, bureaus within the uh, department, and uh, that uh, that responsibility goes from things like the Statue of Liberty in the National Mall in Washington D.C. to the Yellowstone. Statue of Liberty. That's a National Park Service managed piece of property. So even like the maintenance of Lady Liberty herself. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So we we manage everything from things in you know urban infrastructure all the way out to the West in Alaska and Hawaii. Um, the national parks, huge swaths of uh, land in the west, major dams uh, um, that supply water and power to the western United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a really diverse portfolio of responsibilities. Um, and that's um, one of the reasons that we've been looking at and we are um, have been applying drone technology to, uh, to help us better manage those lands with better science, better safety, uh, we think some savings and with more responsive service to the American public. So I'm thinking now, so in the back in the annals of history of the Department of the Interior, you said it was created 1843-ish yes. approximately? Okay, so imagine then, so your title is the Director of Aviation, uh, Director of the Office of Aviation Services. Imagine back then when they first after Orville and Wilbur Wright back in 1902, 1903, 1903, 1903, um, back in 1903, after, you know, the, you know, the U S government started acquiring flying machines, Mm -hmm. the integration of those into the, into the department of the interior must've been a huge boon to its success. And so do you see, I'm, I'm going totally out on a limb here, do you see any similarities between that and maybe some of this drone technology, or do you think it's not as dramatic as I'm making it seem? Uh, you know, I actually think it's more dramatic than you're making it seem. So, so we have um, access to about 1,200 aircraft, mm-hmm. uh, that uh, most of which we contract for, but we have about 200 that are, are in our our government-owned aircraft, and these are small fixed wing and, and some light helicopters. And and you're right, having aviation has been a tremendous uh, mission multiplier for us. You know, being able to get out there and 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 do a lot of this work. Uh, you know, a lot of this territory that we're we're focused on this landscape. It's not only sensitive, but it's remote and you know, in some severe uh, weather conditions and terrain conditions. So that's been extraordinarily helpful. Mm. What we found, uh, and so the, of our 75,000 DOI employees, about 25,000 of them are involved in aviation at this point. Oh, wow. We think that with drone technology, we're going to see at least a 50% increase in the number of people that are going to be involved. Because what we're finding is it's not so much replacing manned aircraft technology, but what we're doing is we're applying drone technology where manned aircraft were either ill-suited, either because of capability or expense, or we just didn't have the, the capability to find an aircraft to do that. Um, a good example was our first drone mission was uh, surveying uh, sandhill cranes at a refuge in Colorado. They were roosting young chicks and all and they're trying to get a count to see what the population is. When was this? This was in uh, 2010. Okay, cool. So we've been flying for uh, a number of years. Uh, and what we did was we flew a battery-powered fixed-wing drone over that flock uh, that was roosting there at dawn at 100 feet. And not one of them moved. Now, years prior, they tried that with a small, light fixed-wing, and everybody scattered. And so they had not been doing it from the air, so their counts weren't as accurate. And without accurate counts, we are making decisions based on poorer science. Mm. And so we're seeing 
a lot of these missions where we couldn't use aviation for whatever reason, technology, cost, um, disruption, that drone technology is now going to give us the opportunity to get in there and and do it with better science, make better decisions, take some people out of some hazardous uh, situations, or reduce the cost because it's taking us a couple of hours to do what took us a couple of weeks, um, and then be able to put these on literally on the backs of our employees and backpacks and let them go out in the field and use them you know, when they want, really giving aviation to the masses at this point. Mm. So the the whole, the example with the cranes, I think that's, so it's just, it has less of a an impact, I guess, on the environment as well, just because they're not big, scary, loud, rumbling, you know, large uh, piston engine aircraft that are just buzzing overhead. And so I guess that's a, one of the other advantages that, um, that uh, UAS have uh, versus some of the larger, um, I guess, fossil fuel powered <laughs> aircraft because if you did a i wonder if the same effect what do you what do you think it is do you think it's a combination of the size you know it's a smaller aircraft and it's a little quieter or do you think if you had an electric powered like cessna for example do you think they'd the birds would still scatter it's a great question i think it's a combination of that because the, i think the visual signature um is is important to you i've actually been in a blimp and flown over low over some animals and they scattered not because of the sound, but because of this huge shadow that <laughs> that came over them. And uh, so I think that the drones, particularly small drones, uh, have that advantage that they can be quieter, and and certainly the visual signature is uh, is less. And as I mentioned, this 500 million acres of land, this is your land, and this is public land. So mm-hmm. another consideration as we're doing our job is to try to not impact. The people that are out there enjoying their land, whether they're you know, recreating or they're doing work on that land. And and so drones also give us that opportunity as well. Mm. Do you have a blimp rating? <laughs> no, I oh, don't. Okay. Have a, I was about to be so <laughs> jealous. You know, I've always wanted to, to be a blimp pilot and be able to say I, I, I'm a blimp pilot. <laughs> I, I, I was at um, my, my last uh, job in the Navy. I was a commanding officer at a Naval Air Engineering Station in Lakehurst, New Jersey. And we had some blimps come in, and they, when they found out I was a test pilot, they offered to take me up, and so I <laughs> got to actually guy. pilot on, under instruction, of course. Oh wow! Okay, cool. That is so cool. Uh, blimps and aircraft carrier landings—it doesn't get much cooler than that, folks. Seriously, <laughs> I'm very jealous. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Wow. So you guys, you, so you recently told me um, you're using drones. The Department of the Interior is using drones. We've been using drones. Uh, actually, started our program in 2006, and in 2009 we started flying. We were developing culture and policy up to that point. Mm-hmm. Our first operational mission was in 2010, and we've flown thousands of hours now and thousands of missions. And like I said, about 25 or so different applications uh, for drones. And we have our sights set on, you know, probably a dozen or more uh, wow. additional um, missions where we think drones will, again, make it safer. Um, and uh, not only for the humans, but maybe for the animals and and, mm-hmm. um, and uh, be less intrusive uh, than methods we're using now. Out of those twenty five uh, applications, um, what do you think or what do you think was one of the most or is one of the most um, just no brainer, so effective that like, you know, I can't believe we weren't doing this sooner kind of things. Does anything like that pop out at you immediately? Um, yeah, sure. I, I think the the one that pops out the most is one we've uh, demonstrated twice and we're still bringing to a full operational capability. And that's the use of um, a full-scale, uh, optionally piloted helicopter to fight fire at night. Wow. So um, the uh, we don't fight fire from the night, uh, from the air at night, and we don't fight fire uh, from the air usually in the morning because the smoke is is uh, down in the um, in the valleys and. It sets up an inversion, so you don't have good visibility. But so you guys, the Department of the Interior also does we, firefighting. Well, that's in that's in our portfolio. Yes. Wow. Okay. Cool. And gotcha. and so what we did is we took some technology that was demo, was developed for the Marine Corps uh, to fly supplies to Ford Marine bases instead of driving them over the roads that were subjected to those IEDs, 
and they flew this helicopter in unmanned configuration. And so we we took that capability and we said, hey, can you do this? And instead of carrying supplies, carry a water bucket or maybe carry supplies out to our um, fire area. And that's been demonstrated twice and we're we're still working on, you know, fielding that technology. But, wow. you know, we, we fight fire from the air and we support our ground firefighters who are the, the men and women who put these fires out and contain them eight out of 24 hours a day. You know, at night and in the early morning, the the fire is on its heels because the winds are down, mm. the relative humidity is up, the temperature is down, and yet we're not able to go out there and fight that fire. Is it because it's dangerous? Well, it is dangerous to get out there uh, and fight fire at night. Um, you know, to get um, qualified to fly night vision goggles, which I have done before, it takes a lot of training to get there, and then it takes a lot of proficiency to stay there. And even though the fire seasons continue to get longer and longer, there's still a seasonality to that. And so to get that capability and and maintain that capability is is difficult. And mm. even then, flying in that smoky you know morning hour um, is, is not possible even under uh, under goggles. So we've demonstrated this with um, again this DoD technology and. When they when you look through the infrared, you can you can see right through the smoke, and you can also see where you've dropped the water because the water is colder than the landscape. Uh-huh. And so now we can measure how effective those drops are. For really, the first time in our history. So we think that's a, a, a potential game changer. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the other part of that is a lot of those fires that start and end up being some of our larger fires. We'll start in the afternoon, uh, you know, right at sunset. You know, a dry lightning storm comes through, the ignition happens, but we can't get in there. So it has, so it has it like has a whole, whole night, to, night burn. to burn and grow. Mm. And so now you might be able to, um, you know, um, catch that early. And so, wow. you know, we're, we're fighting climate change and, and the effects of that. So the ability to use an unmanned capability or an obviously piloted capability in this case uh, to do that. So we would fly those helicopters during the day with all the rest of the piloted aircraft. And then at night, we'd switch out from the rated pilot to the young <laughs> kids sitting in the, in the tent with his uh, computer and having them fly. And he could probably fly three of them because it's mostly just uh, mission planning waypoints. Mm. And uh, I think we could reduce the time to contain those mm-hmm. big wildfires, and that certainly goes to reduce loss, uh, both human and property yeah. loss, and and then all the money it's required to, you know, repair the landscape when that happens. So mm-hmm. that's one of the uh, the big ones. But there's a there's a whole host of things I think that are just uh, you know, r- really show promise. Search and rescue, yeah, is another one. You know, we we endanger our um, employees, our our park service rangers, and going out and looking for folks or rescuing them. And uh, sometimes those rescues turn into recoveries because the individual has already, you know, has died. So now we have the ability to maybe send a drone out there and determine before we put a human in danger whether this is something we need to take care of quickly or this is now a recovery effort and we can take our time and wait till the weather is is better uh, and, and do that. So... Um, now I could go on all sorts yeah. of different mission applications that I think are just really, yeah. um, you know, um, we're just at the beginning of, of realizing the potential for this to uh, save money, save time, uh, and and save human life. So one thing I want to emphasize here is, of course, it's so interesting. Okay, so we have people that are flying their drones mm-hmm. during firefighting activities. Mm. And obviously that is extremely frowned upon. That is illegal. You should not ever, ever do that because there is a highly coordinated, um, basically assault on this fire that you are interfering with. And if you have an unmanned, a small, you you know, just don't fly your drone. I've I've talked about this with someone else, but never someone with so much uh, kind of direct experience with that. And um, yeah, don't ever fly your drone to take videos or pictures of a fire. It's just not worth it, and you're um, endangering lives uh, and and lots of other stuff. Um, Do you what? mind if I please? So uh, I appreciate you bringing that point up, Ian. And uh, 
uh, my feelings are are somewhat m- mixed uh, on. I, I have some empathy mm. for the drone operators, and and I'll explain why and explain what we've been doing. Um, you know, you and I as pilots, we went through a lot of training, mm-hmm. and it wasn't just the 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 stick and rudder, uh, you know, cyclic and collective training. It was uh, an understanding of our uh, our place in the national airspace system, the privilege we had in flying in that, and the responsibility we had for others flying in it, and for those that lived underneath that airspace. Mm-hmm. If you think about your drone operator, I can run down to pick your store, and I can buy one, and I probably don't even have to read the directions. The thing will fly itself. And so those pilots, those operators, have really not gotten that full measure of cultural understanding that that you and I got when we were coming up as pilots. And so because of that, we started a a campaign back in 2015 um, in conjunction with our partners in the U.S. Forest Service and the FAA, uh, kind of a public service um, campaign. If you fly, we can't. So I appreciate you saying don't put your drone in the air, but if we find a drone is in the vicinity of a wildland fire area, we're going to put all of our aircraft on the ground because mm-hmm. we're more concerned about our safety um, and, and the safety of uh, our aerial firefighters and our firefighters on the ground. We do not want to have a drone aircraft collision and, you know, have that aircraft uh, crash. And, and, you know, that would just be unacceptable. So we'll put them on the ground. The unfortunate part of that, of course, is, they're now not supporting those ground firefighters who are there to protect you and your neighbors and your community from that wildfire. And so mm. that fire could grow. It could result in, in loss of property and loss of life. And so we started this this campaign, and it was fairly successful. But the other thing that we learned, we realized, is that um, there are about 75,000 fire starts in the United States every year. That's a lot. The great news is only 2% of those ever become big fires. 98% mm-hmm. of them are contained within the first 24 hours. And why that's important is because because they get contained so quickly, we don't have the need to go to the FAA and, and go through the process to get a temporary flight restriction put over that area. Okay, so you guys have to do that each time? And yeah, say, each, each time. Because, you know, we want to be respectful, too, of, of the the recreational and commercial operations that are in that airspace. And we don't want to just go willy-nilly and, and close off airspace. Yeah. So the problem with that is that only the temporary flight restrictions, the TFRs as they're known, get plotted. And so this year we did a pilot project, prototype, with um, a few companies, AirMap, Skyward, and through AirMap's um, association with DJI, they participated and we were providing them with the location data for every one of those 75,000 starts. Mm. And so they would plot that, and then DJI would incorporate that into their mission planning software so they would not allow you to fly in the area. And, and this prototype was to get a better understanding of whether or not that worked and how our data from the government came across and all that. And we hope to expand that in 2017 to perhaps include everyone so that it might be like going to the National Weather Service site and you could find out where all the fires are. And so now you would have the situational awareness yeah. to know where not to fly. So we're not just wagging our fingers saying, don't fly there. We're telling mm. you where they are so you know where not to fly. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. That, uh, I can't, yeah, I can't argue with anything you just said there. <laughs> That's great. I didn't know you guys were, or were so, I didn't know that was you. I mean, I think like this is a common theme. I'm just like always learning something new <laughs> that the Department of the Interior does uh, in the United States. And so, thank you for everything that you guys are doing. I don't. I don't think. I think you guys are, uh, you know, flying under the radar, as it were. Um, so you're also um, you have okay. So th- those larger firefighting drones. Um, those are. What what aircraft uh, are those based off of? Uh, right now, it's based off the KMAX uh, oh, aircraft. Nice. Uh, so that's the what dual. the Marines, the yeah, dual um, main rotor. That's what the, what the Marines um, used and invested a lot of money into uh, that research and development. And we're um, 
we're hoping to leverage that. Uh, we actually contract for uh, a, a number of KMAX aircraft uh, today to fly manned on fires. Mm. Um, as I mentioned, I have uh, some history in flying and, and managing uh, optionally piloted aircraft. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, there's a lot of interesting aspects to that. You know, right now in the regulatory environment, um, it's still difficult to fly in the national airspace uh, you know, between fires. So we would fly within the TFR in the manned and then in the unmanned configuration. And we have um, authorization uh, from the FAA. I think we're the only agency right now that does to fly beyond visual line of sight within this temporary flight restriction. So we can, uh. we can fly small and uh, large optionally piloted drones uh, beyond visual line of sight, which of course in a smoky fire environment would be very important. Yeah. And then when that fire is contained or you know extinguished and the, want to move to the next fire, we pop the pilot back in and we fly the optionally piloted helicopter to the next fire where it operates during the normal daylight period as a normal manned helicopter. And then at night and then the morning inversion, we can continue to operate that delivering supplies to our ground firefighters or mm -hmm. uh, water or retardant to the fire. Mm. So you guys also have a number of small unmanned aerial systems as well. Um, obviously, those aren't going to be fighting fires anytime soon, although maybe they could help out with some scouting and, and things of that nature. Um, but, okay, so was, besides like some of those wildlife monitoring activities, are you guys doing anything like, you know, very popular right now is a lot of photogrammetry. Mm -hmm. So are you guys doing any photogrammetry, like mapping activities for... I don't know, monitoring things that are happening on those, what, hundred, like millions and millions of acres of land. Absolutely. And, and that's, a, that's a key area right now. Again, we have a responsibility to, to survey that land, to understand what's happening on that land, whether it's a geological or it's a, you know, an invasive species of vegetation or it's a species that we're trying to sustain there and, and is it having difficulty as well as uh, you know our um, our native animals that are out there judging the health of their populations, whether they're not threatened or if they're threatened or endangered, um, understanding their habitat and, and changes. So that photogrammetry is incredibly important. We also have uh, you know a number of uh, archaeological and uh, you know uh, geological uh, sites. You know we call them the, uh, very special places mm. that we have to you know monitor and uh, certainly maintain and and this is a very unobtrusive way of uh, doing it in one of the videos I was showing uh, one of the presentations you can see a, a cliff dwelling you know an old Indian cliff dwelling we can go in and we can really get a good look at that without having to put someone in jeopardy and and maybe disturb that that landscape and that environment by you know having someone climb the rock face fly, to fly a drone into it fly a drone there do some some great imagery um wow. we can also see what's yeah. happening on the landscape through that photogrammetry and uh you know see what uh, what what a flood has done or you know what the erosion is so many applications um and and you're, you're right uh the uh, the fire with the small drones we we've used those a number of times and you know certainly spotting uh, and mapping the fires we've also identified possible use to help our manned aircraft um, operate more effectively because that drone looking in the infrared spectrum can see the fire and maybe hot spots that the operator the pilot in the helicopter can't see mm. and so we can almost be uh, almost a forward air controller, providing them that situational awareness. <laughs> and we're looking at possibly supporting our firefighters on the ground by being able to tell them where danger is and perhaps where an escape route is. You know, we've lost way too many firefighters through, um, through mishaps where uh, there have been burnovers. And so well, we see tremendous opportunities. Again, we're just uh, kind of scratching the surface at this point, and we've been doing it for, you know, a number of years. How big do you think your drone use could get, I guess, as the Department of the Interior? I mean, I don't know. It's such a, it's a hard question, but I mean, I don't know if you can begin to humor, humor me on that. <laughs> well, I, I think as I, I may have mentioned before, I, um, we have about 25,000 employees currently involved in aviation, out of 75,000 or so in the department. 
I think that number is going to increase by 50%. So I think our flying, um, our aviation is going to increase by at least 50%. And um, in our manned aviation, uh, about 69% of all our flight hours are supported by contract aviation. Okay. I also believe that uh, as Part 107 is now out, and as we continue to mature as an industry, um, we will see a, a huge growth in uh, in that area in unmanned. We will be using drone as a service, like we use aircraft as a service in interior. So I would see three to five years, we'll be looking at at least 70% of our drone hours being supported by contractors rather than government-owned aircraft. We'll still have a need for those government-owned aircraft to put them, you know, back in the, on the ATV of the scientist or the ranger that needs to have that at, in a moment's notice. But a lot of it, I think, will be contracted out. So th- you've finally settled the question uh, for me. So this is the third time I've asked this in the podcast that we've been <laughs> recording today at the UAV Expo. And one was answered by uh, an enterprise end user. One was answered by another government uh, agency. A federal agency, and then the second federal agency has just confirmed it basically <laughs> in that um, their drone service providers, you're not going to be losing your jobs anytime soon as long as you're compliant and you do a good, you know, you have all basically just make sure you're nicely well buttoned up, you're following those four steps for success, and uh, you guys are still going to have plenty of work to do for enterprise companies and, and potentially, yeah, even federal agencies as well. Um, if you're, you know, willing to do, you know, contract work, which as a drone service provider, that's like kind of the name of the game. So I think there's been some, confu- maybe not confusion, but just like some worry, like, you know, apprehension that, oh yeah, it's getting so easy that, um, you know, we're going to be out of jobs and everything. But I'm not really seeing that now. I'm seeing there's so many reasons. You Okay, you guys have a lot of employees, but um, you know you can't be everywhere. And if you right. need someone to react really quickly, then you know you pick up the phone on one of your contractors and you know put them into action. So that's really interesting to hear. Um, okay, cool. So yeah, you guys will be contracting out and and making sure just getting the job done. How you how you have to get it done? Absolutely. And like I said, in the manned aviation, we have. So all told, we've got about 1,200 aircraft that we have access to. Um, about 200 of those are government-owned, and so that makes 1,000 aircraft out there that we contract for in, in one form or another. Uh, and why I say it's going to be that yeah, with drones, you're right, Ian. Drones are much less expensive and, and much easier to um, operate uh, in terms of training and cost to operate. So you would think, well, the government's going to get into that a lot and we'll be cut out of the pattern. But you may not believe this, but government folks are business-like. And, and my reason that I want to leverage um, the industry and, and contract for those drones is, is purely business. Uh, that technology is going to be changing so fast. When we get a new drone it's going to be obsolete, just like my cell phone was obsolete when I got it. Mm. And so I would rather have you have the responsibility for staying up with technology and using that as a competitive uh, aspect Mm -hmm. in my contracts uh, and force industry to stay uh, up there. Because if you think about the life cycle of these unmanned aircraft, particularly the small ones, it's probably going to be three to five years, um, and, and that's probably stretching it. So why do I want to buy a fleet of, you know, 1,200 drones of various sizes and then have to figure out how I'm going to get rid of them when mm. they become obsolete in three to five years. Makes a ton of sense, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's a great point, actually. <laughs> um, when was the first time you heard an unmanned aircraft or an unmanned aerial vehicle referred to as a drone? You hmm. said you've been in drones for 25 years yeah. How long did it take from 25, or were they always calling them drones? Was this the media? Yeah, so it's interesting. So um, so in the Navy, the, a drone is a target. And it really, the, the connotation with the drone is you, you set it on a course and it goes. You know, it's got a particular profile and you're shooting missiles or guns or whatever at it. And, and you call it a drone because it doesn't have the ability to be tasked dynamically in flight. 
mm-hmm. where, of course, unmanned aircraft, you, you know, we tried to call them unmanned aircraft systems and UAVs and all this. I was reminded that, you know, if you have an adhesive bandage on your hand because you have a cut, you don't call it an adhesive bandage. You call it a... Band-Aid. Exactly. And it's not a facial tissue. It's a... Kleenex. Exactly. So it's just the vernacular, and um, uh, I'm not threatened by the use of the word drone. It's obviously easier, comes right off the tongue, and <laughs> it's accept, widely accepted like Band-Aid or Kleenex. So, you okay. know. Okay. That's settled. All right. <laughs> cool. So, okay. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, if you had to design the perfect, let's see, firefighting small firefighting drone right now what kind of components would it have and that's yeah we'll we'll go ahead and round it out with this well oh, great great question so um i'll go back to my keynote this morning um so uh first on the uh on the aviation side it would have uh redundancies built in mm-hmm. and, and a robustness that would um ensure that um, it had the ability to recover if there were, you know, system failures. Okay. Um, you know, a kind of a graceful degradation. Mm. It might not stay airborne with all of the degradations, but it would um, go down in such a way that it would not make the situation worse with folks on the ground. I love that that's your first um, feature because you could totally tell that you've been <laughs> in aviation for a long time when speaking about redundancy. Um, <laughs> I think the... Uh, you know, and this is one of the uh, the reasons that we uh, have um, had a measured entry into the drone space. So privacy, um, it would need to have an encrypted uh, control link and an encrypted payload link because you can violate privacy by taking control, whether that's uh, through an overt act or through EMI. Uh, electromagnetic interference that takes, you know, inadvertent control of the drone, fly it where it shouldn't go, mm. and maybe collect imagery that it shouldn't, you know. And as a federal agency, we're, we're very um, concerned with, you know, not violating people's privacy, civil rights, or civil liberties. So having the ability to have that, that encrypted control link and the encrypted payload link so that my my stream of what's going on down that fire is is not immediately being broadcast on mm. YouTube, yeah, you yeah. know, and might capture something that, you know, could, um, you know, be, be someone's house going up or, you know, yeah. something worse happening. So those on the privacy side would, would be that. And then uh, on the security side, you know, we're, we're moving into um, cloud storage, cloud processing of data. So making sure we have um, and we continue to keep up on uh, the security aspects of our um, of drones and making sure that we're talking to industry and and we're reading the privacy policies of the drones that we're buying mm. or we're contracting for and we're writing the specifications in our service contracts so that we all have an understanding of what kind of security uh, relative to that data we are going to require. Um, so those, that would be some of the things I would probably have a long list, but uh, <laughs> what about uh, like sensors and like you know kind of like uh, is there any requirement? I mean, obviously, near infrared or infrared <laughs> sensor. You know, we're um, it, it's a really interesting question because we, you know, we've uh, brought some of uh, our scientists and biologists and geologists uh, and, um, together, and you know we, we want to be able to know everything about. Um, what we're looking at, um, and we want to know what we can't know uh, from looking at it. Mm. So we're looking at multispectral, hyperspectral. You know, we want to know when uh, things are happening on the landscape, whether it's geologically or it's um, to the vegetation, to the animals, um, while we still have time to do something about it. You know, there was a conversation on the panel today about climate change, you know, and what one of the things climate change has done is made a lot of the data we've collected, you know, somewhat obsolete because things are changing. And, Hmm. and it's also um, really reminded us that uh, we have to collect that data quicker Mm -hmm. and we have to collect better data so we can make more uh, agile and informed decisions. So, 
you know, uh, I hate to pick a, a sensor technology. Um, mm. All I can tell you is I want it to be carried on a small quadcopter or, you know, octocopter or small fixed wing. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the real push. Whatever we're flying on satellites, on fixed wing and rotary wing manned aircraft, we want to fly in a drone. So really pushing all of those technologies to get smaller uh, in size, smaller in weight, and um, require less electrical power and less processing power. So that's my Christmas wish list. <laughs> <laughs> you will not be getting a lump of coal, I can tell you that, at least from me, Mark. Um, wow, well, that everything, that was fascinating. So thank you um, so much for, for chatting and, and giving so much insight. Um, I've learned so much about the Department of Interior, what you guys are up to, how much you help out uh, us, the public, uh, with these... Um, you know, I'm just I'm just imagining like drone doing a little like inspection of the Statue of Liberty now. Like, I mean, that's just going to be cool. I think that'll make some headlines maybe <laughs> uh, when people see that on uh, on what is it, Ellis Island is is the uh, uh, Liberty Island Liberty. is where is okay. where the statue is. What am I thinking? What's Ellis? Island? Ellis Island is is where uh, it is also part of the National Park Service where oh, where the immigrants uh, arrived in New York. Okay, another okay. part of our responsibilities actually. So thank <laughs> Perfect. you for that mention. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. Anytime. Awesome, cool. Well, hey, if if you're uh, if you're listening and you want to learn some more about what the Department of Interior is up to with regards to aviation and unmanned aircraft systems, a.k.a. drones, you can go to their website at doi.gov slash aviation. And that's the main web page. And from there, you can find a UAS link. I wonder if it's called drone on there, but I doubt <laughs> it. Um, and yeah, it, it, thanks so much for listening. Um, you can follow the podcast on Twitter at drones podcast or facebook.com slash drones podcast. Um, If you like what you're listening to, go ahead and subscribe on iTunes or whatever you're listening uh, to the podcast on. And we really appreciate it. Um, Once again, Mark Bathrick, the director of the Office of Aviation Services for the Department of the Interior of the United States. Thank you so much again for being here, Mark. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Ian. A pleasure. All righty. Y'all take care.